All right, it's 805, so let's get going. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day 66 of our class. Today, as mentioned here, what we're going to do when we first start. All right, what we're going to do as we start um, is we're going to go over an introduction to the entity framework, also known as EF and also known as EF core. I'm going to go through a couple demos that uh, give you a database first and a code first project. They're both going to be, uh, they're online already and I'll show them to you in just a bit. In fact, you got them sent to you this morning. All right. And they're in though that series of articles that were in the attached zip folder that I gave today. Once we finish, as it says, we're going to begin the lecture on chapter 20 in the Muroc text. Tomorrow we will complete the lecture for chapter 20 in the Muroc text. And I'll also tomorrow I will email you the final project and we'll go over that in detail. Then, as it says, the remainder of the semester is designed to be a lab. Any late work will be taken through two weeks from tomorrow through midnight on the 30th. All right, I'm trying to be fair here. All right, you may or may not agree with that, and that's your right. All right, but what that's going to mean is that on Wednesday, as it says here, I'll be able to spend the period grading the semester projects and on Thursday I'll be able to go over the electronic portfolios all right and the reason I'm doing it like that is especially for the end of semester project or the portfolios if you're missing something that gives me a chance to try to get it back to you as soon as possible if you finish any of this stuff ahead of time, and many of you in the class are not behind on homework at all. Yesterday, your chapter 19 homework and written test were due. Most people have turned those in, not everybody, and I understand that, all right? So again, going along with that, as it says here, your completed chapter 19 homework and written test were due yesterday. And your last real assignment in here, when I, as far as homework and written test, that'll be due by midnight next Sunday. All right. Now, one of the things I mentioned to you last week, and I gave you a, a link to it, a URL, and I said, you know, this was a series of articles. And it's not bad, but in many ways, in my opinion, for whatever my opinion is or is not worth, that series of articles may have been a little bit too heavy for a lot of people. Well, I was out reading yesterday and I found another set of articles. So I'm going to go over a few of these today, not all of them, because there's probably 25 to 30 articles. All right, but I grabbed the first few of them, made copies, you know, converted them to Word documents, made copies, and that's what I sent out to you today in the uh, zip folder. All right, but I wanna go over, like I said, a few of the ones that are in here. So this first one, as it says, it is basically a tutorial for both beginners and professionals, all right? The majority of it uses code first. Now, I wanna mention the difference right away between code first and database first. If you write a code first application, you create all of the classes that will eventually, they will eventually become the database tables. All right, so you create those first, you run a few tools against them and boom, it creates the database for you. There's also the opposite of that, which is database first. We're gonna look at both today. With database first, you create the database first. You again run it through a series of tools. All right, and it creates the classes for you. Now, why did I pick this one that says using the code first when when our chapter, chapter 20, uses database first? Well, what's happening is entity framework is transitioning over and the recommendation is in the future that everyone who creates this stuff uses 
um, uses code first and not database first. OK, and that's why I picked this series of articles. Now it says here. That. Um, it assumes a working knowledge. You all have a C sharp working knowledge. Now this is a little bit older of an article. It's about four years old, but I thought it was pretty good. And this, you know, when notice it's going up, so we, you, your Visual Studio knowledge, of course, is 2022 here. All right, like that. And we've been working with SQL Server. The only difference between SQL Server and MS SQL Server is they put MS in front of it for Microsoft. It is SQL Server that we've been using. All right. So the first thing that's discussed in here. All right, is the fact that Entity Framework is an ORM framework. What the heck is ORM? ORM stands for Object Relational Mapper. All right, and you can kind of look at it like this. That what the Entity Framework does is it sort of acts like a translator. It allows you to perform database operations that can be understood by C sharp. I can't put it any plainer than that. All right, again, it acts like a translator and it allows you to, to put database operations or uh, perform database operations in your C sharp programs where C sharp can understand what you're doing. Now, I mentioned this earlier, way back in chapter 18, a few weeks ago. We're talking about wanting things to persist. If you remember, one of the first things we talked about in this idea of persistence, one of the first things that we talked about in here were files. All right. Well, databases are not files, yet they kind of are. And it, it's not that important that you really even realize it. But the idea is we do want our data to persist. All right. So in other words, once we stop running the application, we want that data to still be there so that the next time we open up the application, the data is still there. All right. So this is the way that they lay it out. And like I said, I'm going to go through a few of these with you. I am going to go over the introduction to entity framework. I am going to go over the getting started with entity framework. I am going to go through the introduction to entity framework code first and the code first example. Now, this one right here, this one, this article, I've given you this also, but I'm not going to go over it now. This article, in my opinion, is an excellent introduction. Those of you who come this um, summer, will be taking the AWD 1115 Database Driven Website Development 2 class. This is a great introduction. What I plan on doing is sometime this week, hopefully, otherwise early next week, is I'm gonna go through that entire article. It's not short, it's about 25 or 30 pages, but I'm gonna run through the example in there very slowly, and that'll be like an introductory lecture for those of you taking the AWD 1115 class. Now, the rest of you are taking the AWD 1000 class, the website development class. For that, I'm going to build a website for you from scratch, and I'm going to give you the code. I'm going to give you the code for this one too. All right, so that's what we'll be working with. All right, then when you look at the rest of this particular document right here, they explain everything that you that you have to do in here how to connect to the database how to initialize the database all right seed data which is one way you know what you can do with your data is you can set it up so that you are pre-populating the database then as it says a code first example all right what they don't have in here is a database first example in this series of articles all right, so they break down the entity framework, the components, the configuration. And they go through all of the different attributes. This is an unbelievably um, 
detailed tutorial on everything that's in here. Do you have to go through all of it? Of course not. All right. This notice it is the beginning of the article. It said it was for beginners and professionals. If you were to get a job in this area, well, yeah, then you'd want to keep something like this. They talk about the Fluent API, which I'm not going to get into at all. Basically, just so you know, with the Fluent API, there are certain settings that you can set, and if you set them, the API will be on or it won't be on the Fluent API. Relationships, we've talked about some of these in class. We've talked about one-to-one -one relationships. We've talked about one-to-many relationships. We've talked about many-to-many -many relationships. All right. The one that you might want to read that I didn't um, put in here, what you might want to look at is maybe the link to entities or one of the other articles in here that go over link. Do you have to? Again, you don't have to do anything. I love that when people you know, contact, do we have to do this? No, I'm giving you extra information if, if, you, if you'd like to go a little further than we go in the class. All right. And finally, as it says in here, and I should have moved that over and didn't, but that's okay. How you can save changes, the different states, and there's a few other things that are in here as well. I'm not going to read these. These in here are referred to as CRUD operations. So we're going to look at those in our examples today as well. Remember, CRUD is create, read, update, and delete. We've been concentrating the last week solely on the read. We've been doing select statements. Yeah, we've had where clauses in there and the like, but we really haven't been doing any inserts. We haven't really been doing any updates. We haven't really been doing any deletes. All right. In the examples today, they, they discuss those and they show examples. I have not done the examples from today, so I'm hoping they work without a hitch, but we'll see. All right, and then there's a couple things, even including the best books you can buy on it. The official, there is an entity framework site. All right, if you notice in there, it is uh, docs.microsoft.com slash en dash us slash aspnet slash entity framework. And again, I can't say this too much. Much of the AWD 1115 class will be centered around you utilizing SQL Server databases, the Entity Framework, and C Sharp. All right. So, like I said, I want to go through a few of these that are in here. So, the first one I'd like to talk about is this introduction to the Entity Framework. I don't expect, I really and truly don't expect 100% of it to make sense. I don't expect you to memorize anything, but you know there's a saying something like four, forewarned is forearmed. The idea is just I'd like to go through some of this terminology with you. All right. So if you look, basically as you can see here, it's a big tutorial and, you, and it links to the previous one and it links to the next one. So I've talked to you already about what an ORM is. I'm not reading this to you, all right? I gave you my definition of what an ORM is. You know, grab from it, gleam from it, whatever you want, all right? But it does, more than anything else, it allows whatever database management system you're using, typically it'll be SQL Server, but it doesn't have to be. It allows it to communicate, so to speak, with your C Sharp application, be that application a console application or be it a, uh, a GUI application. And it does this, as it says right here, through the entity framework. All right, notice it maps the operations to the database. It, it's right here. Okay. Now, one, kit, one chapter we're not going over in here is chapter 21. And chapter 21 in your book is on that green rectangle that you see right there. It's on ADO.net, all right? 
Could we go through it? Yeah, but I want to give you you time to work on your stuff. All right. I'm actually going further. Because I'm going into chapter 20 and when I talked last week to. Um, my counterpart in St. Louis, Doug Gagelman, he's only going through 19. But you know, he's doing a lot of examples. Some of the stuff that I did for you as far as the link queries with using the expression syntax, the link queries, using the method syntax and these SQL, he's assigning those just like I did, but he's not going through them like I did. I don't know what he's doing for the rest of the semester. I have no idea. All right, so why do you want to do this? And this is what they get to here. All right, as it says, it reduces time. Some of the code is going to be written for you. All right. OK, it says developers can work against domain specific objects and not need to worry about how and where the data is stored. Again, you're going to see this in just a couple minutes. All right, because a lot of the code is written for you. It's also for lack of better words kind of been kind of uh, has been condensed. All right, and as it says, that should allow you to increase productivity. Applications are tied to a particular data store. You don't have to write SQL queries. Now that isn't always true. It depends on how you're doing this, but much of the work will be done for you. All right. And as it says, advanced relationships like inheritance, and we know what inheritance is already, associations are the one-to-one, -one, one to many, and many to many. All right. Now there's a whole thing in here on history. I actually removed this from the article that I gave to you. Why? Because we're here. And since we're here, all right, um, I just figured that since since we're there, that's where we should start. Notice again, this is according to this, it's about eight years old. EF7, which I believe to my knowledge is still the one being used. So there are more tutorials in here. There's more stuff that you can get to. And again, I, I've mentioned this kind of thing in accordance with um, our book. The entity framework is very easy to use. Well, you may or may not agree with that. All right. So that's what's in there. And let's look at the next thing, because again, the next thing that's getting started, there's a lot of definitions in here. All right, and then we'll go into the introduction to code first. Now, what you or I would call an entity is an existence of a record in a database. All right, in other words, if I've got an entity called employee, not, I'm sorry, if I have a table called employees, each employee in that table represents an entity, and they give you other examples as well. Properties, notice it says each entry has properties similar to a class. In a class, they're properties. In the database, they're fields. All right, so hopefully you can start to see the mapping that's taking place between these. All right, okay, entity type. All right. It says there it's a collection of entities that share common properties. An entity is a single instance of an entity type. So in other words, it's kind of like when we talked about objects and classes. All right, classes were when you instantiate an object. All right, entities are when you instantiate or create, you know, stuff from an entity type. The associations I've talked about already, you should by now, hopefully at least, have an understanding of a one to one relationship. And I gave you examples of that in the past. Typically with a one to one, what happens is, again, you've got a relationship whereby. All right, um, you've got a table that in, in your opinion or somebody else's is too big. So rather then put all of it in one table, you break it up into two tables. But 
for every one thing in one of the tables, there's one and only one thing in the other table. So anytime you've got a one to one relationship, anytime you have that, all right, it could be changed. So it was all put in one table. I also mentioned that typically what you want is you want one to many relationships between your tables. All right, and that's that's really how relational database technology was set up. And going along with that, as they mentioned right here, <clears throat> is the idea of having primary keys and foreign keys. Again, that's something else, again, that you should understand, all right? You should understand that a primary key is a unique record identifier, can't be null, must be different for each record in a table. And a foreign key is when you take the primary key of one table and you add it as a field into the other into another table so that you're able to have a relationship where you're able to join information between the two tables. Finally, you should understand the many to many relationship and you and realize that again with a many to many relationship all right with a many to many relationship that you come in and you create one of these junction or join tables and when you do that what you're basically doing in there all right is <clears throat> you're taking the primary key of both tables that you want to join that technically don't have anything in common with one another. All right. And you know, you're giving them something in common with one another. All right. All right. Entity key is basically a primary key and entity set, as it says in a in in object or in programming, an entity set is a collection of objects. You're going to see that in just a bit. All right. So here's their picture of the data model. It's not exactly the same as the one you saw previously, but the ideas again are the same. All right. This is you. That's the database. And as you can see what it goes through in here. All right. As it says, it describes the conceptual model of the objects, and it allows you to basically either take the objects and create the database or take the database and create the objects. In this case, it's the objects creating the database. All right, this entity data model, as it says there, it's broken down into layers. So there is a conceptual model or layer, a mapping layer and a storage layer. And when you look in here, as it says, the conceptual model is how it looks from the application's perspective. Remember, technically, C Sharp does not understand databases. And databases do not understand C Sharp classes. That's why we're using the EF or Entity Framework model so that they can communicate with one another. All right, the storage model, as it says, that's what allows things to persist. We've talked about this before and how important persistence is. Now it says it includes the definition of the tables, views, index, stored procedures, and the relationships and keys. All right, so in other words, it's the schema that we create using the data definition language, with you, which is create and alter and drop. All right, and it's also the data manipulation language, the select, all right, the update, the um, insert, and the delete, all right? The mapping layer, as it says there, maps the conceptual model to the storage model, all right? It defines, notice how it says, how, the conceptual model needs to be mapped to the database table. So a lot of this gets done for you, and it gets done for you for lack of better words 
it kind of gets done for you behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about it. You have to set it up, but you don't have to worry about what's happening because it happens for you. All right. Notice as it says there, in the entity framework, you don't access the database. The reason that this is going to become important is if you are writing a C sharp program and you do an update and insert or a delete, you can set it up so you can you can bring up, for example, you could bring up uh, if it was a GUI program, you could bring up a message box that said insert succeeded, update succeeded, delete succeeded, but but that's only on the copy that's in your program. Until you do what's called a save changes method, that's what writes it back to the database. All right. And they mention a couple of things in here. As it says, link to entities is a popular query language that allows you to write queries against the conceptual model. All right. We'll look at some of this in just a bit. And I'm not going to go over the rest, the object, service, the provider, etc. All right. Let's just jump right into this next one here. And again, yeah, I'm going to go through this example. I don't know if doing it this way. I, I went back and forth on this last night with whether whether or not what I'm doing is a good thing or a bad thing. I by no means do I want to confuse you. All right. But I'm hoping that what we're going to do, you know, between now and then going through the next, you know, th this article, this introduction to code first, and then we'll go through it. Then we're going to go through a database first. We're going to quickly build two console applications. Then when we get done with that, we're going to jump right into chapter 20. But I, my hope is that this is going to show you and we're not we're not being bogged down, so to speak, by working with GUIs. All right, we're working with just console. And I actually think that when we go start to go through this, or at least my hope is that it'll make it easier for you to understand. All right, they do mention here that the entity framework has two ways to work with an entity data model. There's something called the visual designer. All right, and there's code first. Now, the visual designer really allows you to do database first or code first. But what it does is basically, it kind of, it, it's the equivalent of it. It kind of draws what looks like um, what we did in class when we worked on, uh, what was, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, when we made those entity relationship diagrams, it kind of does the same thing. All right, it's a graphical tool. Okay, and as it says there, there's two ways that you can do this then using this. You can do model first or you can do database first. All right, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the code first, but in just a second. But it says here, you create the model. All right, and then the entity framework uses that model to generate the database. Okay, some of that is, is explained in chapter 21 in your book. All right, with database first, which we'll look at in just a bit. All right, um, as it says, you've got an existing database. Now it says here that database first is used if you have a database that is developed separately or if you have an, you know, if you have an existing database. So in other words, if either you've got a different group of people working to do the database or you or someone else has already created the database and it exists. All right, now notice database first, model first is going to be retired here. All right, what that means is you have no guarantee over how much longer that will be supported. So what they're saying here is the recommendation is from here on out, you do code first. Just because something is going to be retired typically doesn't mean 
Tomorrow it doesn't work anymore. All right. As an example, and those of you who took the AWD 1000 class with me last semester, you know that when we went over, for example, the HTML or hypertext markup language tags, that many of those tags, probably a good 10 to 15 percent, if not more, they were read when we went through our tag list. What did that mean? That meant that those tags were deprecated. And what deprecated means is that it shouldn't be used anymore, that there's a, a quote, better way, unquote, to do it that you should be using. All right. But just because something has been deprecated, doesn't mean that it's going to go away because there are millions of lines of code out there that use it. That's kind of the way I feel about this. I think it's going to be around for a while. I, I don't work for Microsoft, so I couldn't tell you exactly how long it's going to be around, but I think it'll be for quite a while. All right. All right. What I'm hoping we're going to be able to do between today and tomorrow, think about this. We've already got the Henry database, okay? So I'd like to take the Henry database and we'll do this either later today or tomorrow, depending on timing. And I'd like to take, you know, do that and use a database first and have it create for us all of our classes, all right? Then tomorrow, when I give you, and I, I do have it, all right, and I might even send it out to you today, I don't know, your final database project, I'd like us to start building that together and we'll create the classes and have it create the database for us. So you'll get to see both, all right? And again, some of this I, I just went over you know, previously, all right, but when they talk about the benefits of code first, all right, again, it says there is no auto generated code as in the case of database first or mode first. Modifying the auto generated codes are risky and may break your code. Well, are there ways around that? Yes, and we'll get into some of that as we go on. In code first, you are more responsible for the database schema. And what that means is the better you define things in your classes, the more explicit the schema will be, all right? Because if you don't define something, the system is either gonna take its best guess or default or whatever, all right? Says adding a custom field into auto-generated models, you may need to extend the model class. This is not a problem in code first, as you can add it to an existing class. What the heck does that mean? That means that let's assume that we created a bunch of classes and we've later, let, let's, let's assume we had an employee class. We have first name, we have last name, department. Say we have about five or six fields. And then we realize later that we did not go in and add an employee email we can go back and add that email, all right? And when you do that, basically you've got to do a, a you've got to rebuild the database, all right? And what, what do I mean? Well, you've changed the class, but you've got to rebuild the database because you want to make sure that the class and the table that it's being represented in, represented as in the database are always in sync with one another, all right? And we'll talk about that in just a bit. All right, as it says, code, for, code first migrations allows you to create migration scripts and apply them to the database. If this was something that you were doing on a daily or weekly or even monthly basis where you were constantly creating this stuff, you'd probably create some kind of a generic migration script that you'd put in a library or something else that you could use and bring it up. What's the advantage of that? Well, you're doing it the same way every time. So you test it, you make sure it works. And then basically you're just swapping out the names of your classes or whatever, all right? Finally, as it says, code first can be used both, 
all right, both with existing and with new databases. All right, so what they're trying to tell you is what they get to right here. Again, in EF7, all right, this EDMX that they were talking about is, uh, is being discarded. The code first is what is recommended that you do from now on, all right? So what I'd like to do right now then is to go through this code first example that they show in this document right here. You've got the document, all right? And I'm just gonna follow it pretty much the way that, that they have it set up in here, all right? So as it says, this tutorial lets you create a simple EF code first example, all right? The, the source code you're going to have, because it's in here already, I believe, but I'm going to save this too, all right, where it says link. These are all those articles that we had back at the beginning. They're using 2015, so you know this is a little bit antiquated, all right? Now, a couple things. They're using 2015. We're using 2022. They're using Entity Framework 6.2.0. To my knowledge, we're using EF7. They're using .NET 4.5. I, I am not going to create this stuff using the .NET framework when we, when we create the kind of project we want. I'm going to choose the other one, all right? And yeah, using C Sharp. So again, I don't want to sit there and keep saying the same thing to you, all right? You can read that, what is code first, read that on your own. But I think I've already gone over it with you. All right, at least hopefully you have at least a fundamental understanding of what it is we're talking about. So as they mentioned there, I'm going to open up, I'm gonna follow these examples right here. I'm gonna open Visual Studio right now. And we wanna create a new project. And we want a console app. We do not want the console app.NET framework because remember, that's going to hand-strung us to where we have to use 4.8.2. We're going to choose this one right here, all right? And the reason we're choosing that one is it's going to allow us to use the stuff that's in version eight of C Sharp, all right? So we selected console app. They want you to call this EF getting started, okay? And I'm gonna change the path but in here, I'm just gonna change the name of the project to EF Demos because we're doing two of them. So I have made the project name EF Getting Started. The location, what I did was I made a folder that I called EF Core Examples. You can see that it's empty. All right, I'm gonna select that folder and I'm going to say, next now remember when we do this this is why we're doing it like this we want dotnet 8.0 long-term support so i'm going to click create and basically it gives us not a whole heck of a lot all right we don't need this we don't need either one of these so i'm going to get rid of those all right that's it's a good news, bad news. I mean, there's really nothing in there right now. All right. So we're going to start putting stuff in. All right. But the first thing that we're going to do, and I'm going, I'm, I'm going to change this just a little bit from what's in the article, and I want to explain why as I do it. I'm not going to worry right now about creating a class library. Maybe I should, but I'm not going to. I don't want to get stuck on that stuff. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into our project right here. I'm going to right mouse click on the project EF getting started, and I'm going to choose add, and I'm going to choose class. Now, what they call theirs is model.cs. All right, but then when they fill it up, it says public class user. So instead of model.cs, I'm going to call mine user.cs. Okay, that's just the way I decided to do it. So there it is. 
you've already seen this kind of stuff that typically we don't need this. And we change that from internal to public. All right. Now, we've never really much, at least, gone over what exactly is happening when you're making that internal and you're changing it to public. If you leave it at internal, then basically what it says is the assemblies, and that's the internal code basically connected to this project, has access to anything, any of it that's in there. But any non-assembly stuff won't have access because it's internal. By making it public, what we're saying is if we need to do so, we can have this class communicate with any other class that needs to. All right. OK. Now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put the, the same three things that they show on the bottom of page three. Well, it's in this document. So public int user ID with a get set, public string name with a get set, and public string email with a get set. And that is going to be in here. That is going to be our class. Now, a couple things about this. You normally never put anything here, just so you know. Just leave it the way it is. In here, it's giving me two warnings, and it's telling me non-nullable property email must contain a non-null value when exiting constructor. All right, and the, the other thing says the same thing for name. There's two ways that you can try to solve this. One is you can come in here and you can put in a question mark, all right, which basically says allow nulls. And you notice that after I did that, all right, those errors both went away, all right? The other thing that you can do is you can go and come in here and say equal string dot empty, and that will also get rid of them if you do that, all right? Now, which is better? In many ways, it's a crapshoot. It doesn't matter which way you use it, all right? Many people will tell you that they think putting the question mark there is easier because then you don't have to do all that typing. All right. And again, that question mark is just saying, hey, we're allowing for nulls in there. So if you don't know the name of someone or you don't know their email, it'll be OK. Now, in the example that's in this article, they don't do either one of them. But what I'm trying to do here good, bad, and different, or whatever, okay, is I'm trying to tie a few things together, all right? And if there's something I've missed in the past, I'm trying to go over it with you right now, all right? So that is going to be our user class, okay? So I'm going to do a file, save all, and I'm going to close that, all right? Then next, and I'm going to jump back to the article back and forth just so you know what's going on here. All right. Yeah, we're going to talk about installing that stuff. We'll get to it in just a minute. But I want to show you we just did this and I want to show you this. All right. The DB context, as it says, is another class. That is responsible for interacting it's again helping you to establish this communication between the database and the program. As you can see there, it allows you to query, insert, update, and delete operations on the entities. So in other words, it's going to eventually allow you to do the CRUD operations. All right. It says the class is derived from, which means that it's got a parent that's called DB context. All right. And as it says, it's actually a wrapper around this class. So it is, is doing whatever needs to be done for you. Notice here, as it says, it is at the heart of the entity framework. And as mentioned there, 
it has several responsibilities. Managing the database, the database connection, creating the database, and initializing the database. All right, you can read the rest of it there too. If you want more than what I'm giving you, this is a link to one of those articles that we mentioned earlier. All right, now we're going to create this, but before we do, I want to fall and, and be using what they talk about here. We want to install the entity framework. Now, this uh, article is a little old. The way we do it is this way, but I want to make sure that you see this. This is also in your book in Chapter 20, so you're going to see it again. But when you come over here into your project, right now, right now, this program knows absolutely nothing about working with um, databases or whatever. It knows nothing. All right. So we're going to help it understand. And the way we do that is we go up to tools here. And under tools, about halfway down, it says NuGet Package Manager. All right. And there's three things here. The package manager console, which we'll talk about later. The manage new get packages for solution, which we're going to talk about now. And this package manager setup. This in here, you should never have to touch. All right, you can go through here. It's got all the defaults, which should be fine. But if for some reason you want to look through it and change things, you can do that there. I don't know why you'd want to. I've never, ever, ever done anything with that. But with what we're doing, we want to do a tools, NuGet package manager, and we want to go to the middle option, which is manage NuGet packages for solution. Now it brings this up. And right now, what it brings up by default is what's installed. And notice what it says. There are no packages found which means nothing has been installed. All right, so what do we do? Well, the easiest way to do this is to go over to browse and we wanna add two packages. Now we could go and work our way through here. There aren't that many of them, all right? There really are not, but I'm gonna show you what I think makes it easier. So I'm first gonna type in tools, all right? And you'll notice it comes up with a few things here. The one we care about is Microsoft Entity Framework Core dot tools. Microsoft Entity Framework Core dot tools, not the diagnostic and not the other ones that are in here. So I'm going to choose this one and notice when I clicked on it, it puts it over here and it says, OK, what do you want to do? All right. Well, I want it to be in my project, so I click up here. And now it says, what do you want to do with it? I want to install it. Now, occasionally when you try to do this, it gets a little hinky and it may or may not work, but we hopefully at least aren't going to have any problem with this. So I'm going to click install. And it's doing a bunch of stuff. It's installing a bunch of junk for us. All right. And it should come back right here. And it says, this is what you did. All right, are you okay with that? Now, if you're doing it for the first time, because I'm not, you might get another alert that comes before this. And on there, there'll be a little thing over here that says, click the checkbox to not see this anymore. So click that and click okay. I've already done that, so I can just click accept. All right. and. What did it do? Doesn't look maybe like it did much of anything, but if I go back to installed now, there it is. I've installed the tools. All right, so I'm halfway there. I'm going to go back to browse. All right, and now in this box where I typed in tools, I'm going to type in SQL server. And you may or may not have guessed already, but the one we want is the first one, Microsoft Entity Framework Core dot SQL Server. All right, so I'm going to click on that as well. Okay. 
double click on it, whatever, click on it. There it is. Okay. And it's asking me again, what do you want to do? I want to install it. It automatically filled it in for the project, et cetera. It says it's not installed, so I'm going to click install. It's putting some more junk in here. And it came up with that thing again, and I accept. Now, with what I'm going to show you next, you don't have to do this, but I am a very untrusting person when it comes to software. So what I always do is I close this. This is the new Get Package Manager. I close it. Then I immediately open it up again. I go to Tools, New Get Package Manager, Manage Packages for Solution, and I go into Install to make sure both of those packages have been installed. All right. Some books will tell you that you should install the tools first and then SQL Server. Some books will tell you you should install SQL Server first, then the tools. I've done it both ways. It does not appear to matter which way you do it. All right. Could I be wrong? Of course. All right. But now I can close this. So now when you look in what we've done in here, and I'm going to go till about five after. Okay. So we did now, we installed the entity framework. So that's what we just did in here. All right. We built this entity. That was our class. All right. I just explained to you what the DB context was. All right, so now we can create the context. All right, it says you can add a DB context in your project by creating a class that derives from the DB context class. All right, the name of this, I'm gonna use their names, okay? But you, you don't have to call it EF context. For instance, if I'm creating a program that's going to be about employees, I might want to call it employee context. So the name really and truly doesn't matter very much. All right. But I'm going to just follow their lead here. So copy that. So I'm going to go back to the project. All right. I am going to right mouse click on the project name, the EF getting started right here. And again, choose add and again, choose class. And name it, as I said, what they named it, efcontext.cs. OK. And I'll click on add and there's that one. OK, again, I'm going to make this public. And again, I probably don't need any of this. OK, so I'm going to start it like that. OK. <clears throat> now we've added this to our project, but as of right now, it's not doing a flaming thing. It's not doing anything. It's an empty class, but it's something that we do need. Now, in this handout that I'm going over with you in here, it says that this exposes the generic version of DB set which represents the collection of data entities or the entity set. Let's just put it this way. When we do it this way, it's something you need to make the program work. All right. And that's the easiest way that I can tell it to you. Now, a couple things. The first thing is we want to say here, this is going to give me an error. Don't worry about it. We'll fix it in a second. But we want to say that this inherits from DB context. Now it's giving us an error because it doesn't know about that. So that means we're going to need a using statement up here. Okay. So if I click on that, we want using Microsoft Entity Framework Core. That was the second NuGet package that we added. The reason I'm telling you that is if you don't add those NuGet packages first and you try to do this, you'll get an error because it won't understand. This again is part of our communication mechanism between our program and the database, all right? Okay, now DB set provides 
different methods. All right. It, there's different things that it does. All right. To, to basically allow you to manage and go through all this stuff. The first thing you put in here typically is you let it know what's going to be your table or tables. So I'm going to come in here and say public. DB set. And if you remember, we've got that one that we created that was called user. All right. And it says, oh, you want to call this users and put a get set in here. Typically, you'll accept the default as they show right there. Do you have to accept the default? The answer is no. You could call it something else if you wanted to do that. All right. If you wanted to do that. OK. But in here right now, and there's other things that can go into DB context. One of the things that quite often would go in there, they don't do it in this example, but those of you, again, everybody eventually in this program takes the AWD 1115 class. All right. And what you'll find is when you start creating this context class that you will add what's called seed data, which means those are a few records that you put in so that you'll be able to test the database to make sure it works. We're not adding seed data in here, but you can do that. All right. OK. All right. So I'm going to come in here and do a file, save all. And for now, at least, I'm going to close this. And now I'm going to come up here. Now, I'm going to go back to an old program. I've done this before. I'm going to go back to an old program up here. And let's see. This should work. All I want is something like this. Okay. And we put it in, then I'll explain what I'm doing here. It's probably going to give me an error. Don't let it throw you. Right now, there's nothing in there. All right. We want the namespace, which is EF getting started. All right. And internal class program, and I don't care about this, but we want our static void main. Main again is our entry point to the program. So if I come in here now and do this, and then do this, okay? Now I have no errors, but main isn't doing a flaming thing, so it's really not going to help me very much. All right? Now in the book, it says, or the, the article I gave you, it says open the program class in the main method, paste in the following, all right? And this is to be able to add a user. Well, what I'm gonna do, it's called add user. So I'm just gonna call in here, add, whoops, I'm sorry, add user. Now it's gonna give me an error, and it's gonna give me an error because I haven't written anything yet called add user. So let's do a static void add user. Oh, I'm sorry, not voice. Void add user. The error should go away now. All right. So all those errors are gone. Now we're going to put this in. I'm going to explain it. Then we're taking our first break. All right. Now we don't have to do this, but remember, I like putting in here using static system.console and I do that so I don't have to always write system.console.write line or console.write line. I can just write in here so I can just put in a write line here that says adding a new user. Okay. All right. So that's what we want to do. Now I'm going to put in a user right here. So we are hard coding the user in right here. This isn't normally the way I would do it, but again, 
we're starting off slowly here. All right. So notice if I come in here and say user, it, it sees that. It knows that from my class that was called user. And we'll call it user one. I think they call it USR in the book, but it's okay. All right. Equal new user. And we will put in here. Name equal, and I'll put my name in there. They use Sashin or something like that. So I'm just going to throw my name in there. All right. And email equal, and I'll put in my email. Now, all I'm doing in here, this should, if we do it correctly, and I don't want to, the, I don't want that there. There we go. All right, that should allow us to add a new user into the database. But it's conceivable this could fail, and it could fail for a few different reasons, such as maybe I don't have the authority to do that. All right, maybe there's a problem with the system. So what I'm going to put in here, this is what they show in the book. All right, I'm going to say try. And we'll have a catch in here that we'll put in as well. So in this try, we're going to say let's see. All right, in English, what that is saying is what we want to do is we want to come on, we want to add user one to our users table. And remember, we want it to also reflect in the database itself. That's what this line is going to do. All right, but just in case it fails. All right, so if it were to fail, we'll do a right line in here. And all we'll put in is the message that it gives us. So ex dot message. All right. I'm not. I'm, I'm not being real critical here of the stuff that we put in. So what are we doing here? Let's go over it. Like I said, then we'll take a break. I'm following what is in this handout I gave you. We first came in here, and this line, the line that is, where are you? Right here, this is technically a line of code. All right, in that line of code, we are doing what? We are instantiating. So instantiate a new user. I should even say, you know, that that is actually what we're doing in there. All right. Then after we do that. Now we're going to instantiate an instance of DB context. We're allowing, we're, we're setting it up so that again, we're going to have a way for our program to communicate with our database. All right. What that should return is basically the user entity all right so we come in here and attempt to add the user all right and then in here we attempt to write changes back to the database that's exactly what we're doing in there. All right. Okay. Now, 
to see whether or not this works, we've already got in here our call to add user. That's good. Now, remember what we want to do afterwards, to, just so we can see if it works. We're going to put a right line in here that basically says something like, you know, this is what they do in the in the handout. Press any key to continue. And then they put in a read line. Oops, sorry about that. OK, then it says run the application. If everything worked, all you should see on the screen is press any key to continue. So let's see, let's do a file, save all, and let's run this. And it's kind of hard to see, let me get it bigger. Adding a new user. Now it says no database provider has been configured. Don't worry about that yet. But then notice after that, it says, after that it says, um, press any key to continue. So we have not defined our database yet. We're gonna do that after the break, all right? It is 9-11, let's come back please at 9-25. I will be back in about two or three minutes myself. All right, so please come back at 9-25.
All right, it's 925, so I'm going to continue on. <clears throat> it does give me an error message here that says that um, no database provider has been configured, which is true. So I'm going to press any key to continue and hit enter. All right. So I'm back here now. What they said in the article, which is what should happen here and what happened were two different things. It said that you should now be able to go into here. Go into databases and there should be a database in here. And that database that's in there should be called. EF getting started dot EF context, which didn't happen. As you can see it's not in there. All right, so I went back and looked at the article. And again, should I have done this yesterday? Yeah, did I do it yesterday? No, OK, but. I found this thing in here on database visualization. There we go. All right. And there's different ways that you can initialize a database. According to that one, and, and since it's an older article, it may have changed since then. All right. But there's different ways that you can create a database. Now, one of the ways or one of the things that you can do in here is something that's similar to what we looked at in the past. I guess this isn't the right article, but it's here. There we go. All right. It says here. And literally, I grabbed this from the same article. Database connection in entity framework it says in the EF code first example, we built a simple CRUD app. The entity framework created and initialized the database. It didn't, even though we did not specify any connection string. In this article, we learn how the entity framework discovers which database connection to use and how we can modify it. So it says open the project we used in the last tutorial. You can download it from here, etc. Well, we're trying to do it ourselves. And if for some reason I can't get it to work, I'll download theirs and see if I can get that one to work. We'll see. All right. So it says here the database connection to be used is determined by the parameter passed to the constructor of the DB context class. There are two scenarios. Number one is no parameter, and that's what we did. Number two is the name or the connection string. We'll look at that in just a minute. So with no parameter, this is exactly what we did. As it says, we have not passed anything to the constructor of the DB context class. All right, so here the entity framework should create the database either in a local DB or an SQL Express. It did not. The name of the database should be a fully qualified should be this. OK, and it says the following image shows what should happen. Well, I went out there to here and looked under our databases. All right, so again, you've seen this, but just so you do see it when I do come out here. And I go and look under databases. It's a little confusing because they almost make it sound like it should be under system databases. It's not there. All right, these are all system things. But underneath here, and I even tried to refresh. And there is no EF. Getting started dot EF context here. All right, it ain't there. So. This is what it says. And then it says the configuration file for it looks like this. Well, it says if you want to change it, you can do that. All right. But I got down to here. All right. The DB context also takes the string constructor. You can either pass the name of the database or the connection string to the constructor. All right. It says you can pass the name of the database here. And it says EF will create the database using what's called the default connection fact factory provided in the web.config file. But I'm not sure if we've got a web.config file. So it says open the project and change our context so it looks like this. So I'm going to grab that code that's right there. 
copy it to the clipboard. And I'm going to come back to the program here. And that is in our EF context. So I'm going to change this line right here, which is what we had. And I'm going to paste in this. It'll give me an error, but I'll fix it in a second. Comment out that one. All right. Now, give me a bunch of other errors. It says public. Method must have a return value. All right. And it's saying EF context base. Well, I'm again, I'm trying to follow their instructions, so we're going to see if we can make this work. And if we can't, I'm just going to go on. All right. So what they show in there is this like that. And the way they show that is it's empty. And then they put the DB set underneath it. So let's see if we do that. So I'm just going to put in open and close curlies. Doesn't like that either, as you can see. So I'm going to get rid of this and this. That's the way they've shown it in the book. Or in the handout that we have, I believe it is at least. So let's look. Public, where is their public class? Oh, okay, then maybe I screwed it up. That's fine. I want to do it the way they're doing it in here, and hopefully it's going to work. So public class, EF context, EB context. OK, I was a little screwed up here, as I often am. All right. That's how they show it is like that. All right. Now it's give me an error. And it says argument one cannot convert string to Microsoft.entity core DB context options. All right. We're telling it basically in here to create the database when you run the program using this. Probably I should have found a, a later article than the one we had here, but I didn't, so let's see. That shouldn't matter a bit. And of course, it's not giving us any hints, so. Well, there's our class. This is our constructor. All right, so what we're telling it to do is to basically create this database, do nothing else. All right, and then underneath it, we've got the table that that database will at least hopefully contain. All right, the problem is it doesn't understand this says argument one cannot convert from a string to something to Microsoft entity framework core dot DB context options. All right. And can I fix that? I don't know. What I'm going to try to do is. And if this if this doesn't work, I'm just going to say uh, let's see. Yeah, didn't think it would take a raw string in there. Uh, 
but it's not going to fix it either. All righty. All right, let me go back to the article and show you. All right. There's other ways you can try to do it too. All right, as it says there, you can have something in here where you put in here EF connection string. I'm going to try that one, see if I can get it to work. It's going to involve me doing a couple things here. First is I have to replace that with this. It's going to give me a different error, but don't worry about it. All right, so name equals that. Now I'm going to come in here and attempt to add a web.config file. I thought it would have been in here. Of course, it's not. I don't know what this is going to do, if anything, but. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, it doesn't like any of these, so. Okay. Well, it looks as though what I thought would work is not going to work. So let me do a file save all here. But I think if I run it, it's just going to come up with the error. All right. Let me explain what should happen. Okay. You've already seen this kind of thing before. This is a connection string. So you've seen this kind of thing before. We've created things like this before where we set up a connection string saying this is the server that we're using. This is the name of our database. And we want to add the built in security. All right. This this provider name, it shouldn't matter whether we have that in there or not. All right. But usually what happens when you create a project like this is it creates a web dot config file. It didn't do that here. Since it didn't do that here, all right, I tried to create my own. Well, you saw how well that didn't work. All right. So it should have come in there and created this and put all that in there for me, but it didn't. All right. Now, it says here's the source code. I just want to see if theirs works. That's all. Then we're going to go on.
All right, so there is this called EF code first. There it is. Try it again. Good gravy. All right. You know what? <clears throat> I'm going to punt and I'm just going to go right into chapter 20. All right. We'll just do it with the new stuff. I thought that this would help. It's doing nothing but hurting. So I'm just going to jump into chapter 20. OK. All right. As it says in this chapter, you will learn how to use EF Core to work with the data in a database. OK. Some of this will be review, some of it will be new. <clears throat> to use DF Core, you create a data model that maps the objects. Then you can work with those. So we'll talk about how to create a data model, how to use link with EF Core, and how to use EF Core to modify a database. After that, we get into how to bind controls. And what binding means is when you run a program, and you've got combo boxes and text boxes, et cetera, that what you are able to do is to fill up that information or fill up those controls with information from an actual database itself. All right, let's go through this. Sorry, I thought this would work and this would be a great example and it did nothing but stick. All right, I don't want to... Uh, Go back and, and, and rehash over the same thing. So let's go right into here. All right, this is their picture on how things work. I'm not going to read it to you, OK? They immediately go in and talk about how you can query the database. You can query the database using either link or SQL. The disadvantage of querying the database using SQL is that you're you're creating strings that represent your queries. And it's very easy to do it wrong, for lack of better words. You don't get the, a lot of the compile time checking that you get when you use link. So again, the idea is you really should be using link. It's the better way of doing it. But as we saw before, as it says here, EF core is the layer between the database and the objects. And the idea is it allows them to communicate with one another. It uses the DB context class and entity classes. These entity classes are going to be the classes that get defined for the program. All right, the classes that get defined for the program that are going to have the same name as what's in the database, except in the database, the names of those files are, are the, those tables are going to be pluralized. And when you create them in your program, they'll be singular. So rather than employees, it'll be employee, et cetera. All right. When you create a, clear, a query with link, EF Core translates the query to one that can be executed by the database. So link is C sharp, all right? And you have to make sure that the database can understand what it is you're trying to do. And then when it goes back the other way and you get information back from the database, you've got to make sure that C sharp 
can understand it as well. All right. So how to add EF core to your project? The good news is this is what we did before. So let's look at it. Same exact stuff. All right, they have you do the SQL server, then the tools. I had you do the tools and then the SQL server. All right, is there a reason that for doing one as opposed to the other? Technically, there shouldn't be, but those are the two things that you will want to do. All right, is to go into the package, the new get package manager. All right, and you want to go in and add those. All right. Okay, how to generate DB context and entity classes. It says there, EF Core provides two different methods. First, you can start by defining the data model, then use EF Core to create the database based on those classes. If you already have a database, you can use EF Core to generate the database context class for you to communicate with the database and the entity classes. Notice it says here, you'll learn how to use this technique in the next few features. Then it says for more information on how to create a database from a data model, it says please see the online documentation. Well, this is what I'm going to try to do. Like I said, I punted, and what I'm going to try to do right now is I'm going to try to use the Henry database that we've already created, the one we've been working with. I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to make a couple changes to it. I'll explain why when we make those changes. And then I am going to come in and attempt to, um, to do the database first and create the classes. All right, so again, we'd have classes for every table that we've created in the database. All right, so we're going to follow these steps that are right in here. All right, so to do that, let me just get rid of this cluster that I had before. I'm not going to even save it, but I've got a Henry link. I don't think I've got a database in here. I don't believe I do that I have a database in here, a garbagey database or a project rather that I've, that's called Henry DB. So I'm going to try to make one right now. If I have one already, I'll have to use a different name. So I'm going to come in here and put in Henry DB. It says I do have one. All right, so I'll call it Henry Database. Just an empty folder. All right, now you've already seen this, but I'm going to come in here. I'm going to start up Visual Studio. I'm going to tell it to continue without code. All right. Now I'm going to come in here. And you already know this, you've seen it before. Then in here we've got our database that's called Henry DB. All right. And if you look here, there's our tables. All right. Now I'm going to change the name of two of the tables. Why? Because again, the system is expecting that when I'm working with tables, they're pluralized. So I've got authors, looks good. Brooks, books, looks good. Branches, looks good. I'm going to rename this one from inventory to inventories. So it'll be T O R I E S and hit enter. All right. And it's telling me that it's doing a rename. Are you OK with that? And I'll tell it to update the database. Should work without a hitch. All right, and I'm going to do the same thing. Publishers is OK, but I'm going to change wrote to wrotes and I'll get the same kind of thing you just saw. And tell it to update the database. Now, if I come in here and refresh, all right, and I'm going to get out. And I'm going to get back in again. Those should be changed. I got out just so I'm sure I'm starting from scratch. But if I come back in here, my hope is that those two database tables have been renamed. I should have pluralized them at the start. 
I did not. So there's rotes, publishers, inventories, branches, books, and authors. So right now, it looks good. All right. All right. Jumping back into our book then. It says to generate the code for the DB context and entity classes from an existing database, you use the scaffold DB context command. You enter this command from the package manager console. We're going to go over it in just a second. Now, if I go back to my program here, all right, right now there's nothing in here. I don't have anything set up except this. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this. All right, I'm going to go back, start up a new project. So I'm going to create a new project. It will be a Windows Forms app, but not with a .NET framework. So right there. All right, and I'm going to call this. I'll call it Henry DB. All right, that'll be the solution name as well. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to call this EF Core for the name of the solution. All right, and where am I going to put that? I'm going to put that into the new thing that I just created that's called Henry Database. All right. So I've got Henry DB for the project name. It's being put on my desktop in the Henry database, and I'm just calling the solution name EF Core. Next, I want to make sure it's version eight. So I'm going to create. All right. And right now, I'm not worried about the GUI at all. I'm worried about trying to make this thing talk. So the form should come up momentarily. There it is. The hope is later when we get to the end part of the chapter, we'll be able to add things in here and you know, grab one of the tables like the books table. All right, technically what we should be able to do then when we get to that point, we'll see if it works or not, is we should be able to come in here and I'm going to create one, two, three, four, five, six different forms. This will probably be just a splash screen that will allow us to get any place. And then we'll have a form for authors, a form for books, a form for branches, a form for inventories, a form for publishers, and a form for routes. Ideally, that's what we're going to have. All right. Right now, there is no communication mechanism whatsoever between this database and this program. That's what we're going to attempt to do right now. All right, so it says you can use the scaffold minus DB context command. You enter this command from the NuGet package manager console. Well, all that means is before we went in and let's let's go in and let's add like we did before. So I'm going to go to NuGet package manager console. All right. And I'm going to come in here and add. I, I'm going to try doing it the way they're showing it here. So right there, there's the console down here. All right, it's a console, so it's kind of like the old DOS window. I can clear this, et cetera, and put in whatever I want. Now, I'm going to try to follow what they say in here. If it doesn't work, I'm going to go back in and I'm going to add those two SQL or those two EF core packages that I showed you before. All right, hopefully between the two of those, I can get it to work using one way or doing it the other way. We'll see. All right, but let's look at what's in here. There are a lot of things that you can put in here. In fact, if I move up, you can see how big it is. We're gonna do something similar to that, but let's first take a minute or two to go over what this stuff means. All right. All right. 
says the first table in this figure presents some of the parameters that are available for this command. The connection parameter and the provider, as they mentioned, are required. The connection parameter specifies the connection string needed to access the database. So this, this is where we're basically going to come in and set everything up, kind of like I, I showed you before where it didn't work, but we're going to do that in just a minute. The provider specifies the database provider that we're going to use for this. It says this value is typically the name of a NuGet package. Well, if you notice in here, it says specify Microsoft.DataEntityCore. I don't think we've specified those yet. So I think we're going to have to do that, but I want to run it without putting them in to see if I get an error. Then we'll run it again after putting them in if we get the error and see if that fixes it. All right. Now, then there are some optional parameters such as, well, you notice there's an output DIR parameter and that says, where do you want this stuff to be stored? Notice what they mentioned there. If you don't include this parameter, Everything gets stored right underneath the root, which gets really messy. In most cases, as it says there, you'll want to store the generated files in a subfolder. Here, we're telling it to create a models folder and underneath that put a data layer folder and then put the generated files into that folder. That's a way of doing it. All right, it's a way that it's fairly often done. Then there's a context parameter. And as it says, it specifies the name to use for the generated context file. If you don't include this parameter, you get a really ugly name that's put in by Visual Studio. You may or may not have noticed, I mentioned this last week, but I want to say it again because it's kind of drawing a comparison. When we came in last week and we created the Henry database, and you'll remember when I set up some foreign keys, I called it FK underscore employee, for example. If you don't do that and you don't give it a name, what you get is you get a name that's set up by the database, which will be something like FK underscore followed by a series of 12 letters and numbers, which don't make sense. In the same way here, if you don't put in a name for the parameter, it, it, it just is going to make one up for you, and you don't want that. All right, then there's three more parameters in here. So we're going to we're going to look at all this in just a second. It says if you don't include this. Data annotations. It says the generated classes are configured using the Fluent API. I showed you that before. What it means is you've got less control when you use the Fluent API. Things will be done for you, but it won't be annotated. What does that mean? Well, as an example, if you go in and you create a primary key, okay, in your program, it's not going to, it's not going to say inside of your, um, inside of your .cs, file. So inside of the uh, class file, it won't say that it's a primary key. You might say, well, big deal. I can figure it out. Yeah, usually you can. All right. But if you add data annotations, normally it'll put in something like this. It'll put in key. So you know that's a primary key. It'll also put in something like, and I, I, I could be messing it up, but it's something like this. Um, String length equal like 50, something along those lines. Again, that may not be perfectly putting it in there, but it's letting you know that the maximum size for this is 50. So what annotations do is they provide extra documentation. All right, that's, that's, their, that's their goal. All right, it says if you don't include the minus use database name, EF Core changes the names of the tables and columns in the database so that they conform to the C sharp conventions when it generates the entity classes. It says, in particular, 
it uses Pascal notation. Is that a big thing? It says, for example, if you named your field customer ID, it'll automatically be changed to customer ID like this. If you want control over how things are named, you'd want to include the minus use database names parameter. All right. Then it's there's what's called a force parameter. Now, with this force parameter, what can happen is if you are going in and you are creating a table, then you decide to update that table. All right. What it what can happen, depending on how it's set up, is some of the files that have been created can be overridden. Written. Sometimes you want that to happen. Sometimes you don't. All right. So if you don't want that to happen, you can use this minus force parameter. All right. To basically allow or to not allow something to happen. So let's go back to this page. I'm not going to read these. This is what I just tried to mention for you. All right. Now they show, as it says, some common values, and we're going to add something like this. Now it says here, I'm going to put in all the required commands. So I'm going to grab this right here, and I'm going to copy it to the clipboard, and then I'm going to put it right in here. All right, so we're going to break it up so we can look at everything that's in here. So it says scaffold equals DB context. Then we've got our connection string. This should not look new to you. Data source equals this right here. Next is what we want to name. So what database we're using? Well, we're not using mmabooks.mdf. We're using, I think it was Henry DB, but I'll double check Henry DB. Now, usually you don't have to put the .mdf in there, but since they show it, I'll leave it in. So it's Henry DB. All right, then we've got our integrated security is true. Now, we should be able to put this on another line. And it says we're using the Entity Framework Core SQL Server. Okay. This says, when you run this, create a models folder, create a data layer folder underneath that, and put all the files that get created in there. Then, well, I don't want this to be called MMA books context. I'll call this Henry DB context. All right, finally, we're using data annotations. And if necessary, we're using force. I believe you can put this on multiple lines. If for some reason it doesn't like what I'm doing, you'll know when I know. I think if it fails, it's going to fail because we haven't added this. Now you can say you added that before. You've got to add it to each project that's going to use it. So I'm going to try this. I believe it's going to fail, but we'll see if it does or not. So I'm going to grab everything in here that I just explained to you. All right, I'm going to come into our program here. I'm going to go up here so you can see everything that I'm putting in. This is the NuGet Package Manager console. Sometimes it's called the NPM console, and I'm going to paste that in. All right, and you can see it didn't like it. All right, it says the term minus context isn't recognized. Command not found exception. Output dir is not recognized. It doesn't like a lot of the stuff that's in here. All right. Scaffold.context. It's not recognized. I think, I think it's not recognizing all of that because, again, we've got to first go into tools, NuGet Package Manager, manage NuGet packages for a solution, just like we did before just like we did before. Come in here, installed is empty, go to browse. I'm gonna come in here and put in tools. And I'm going to grab the, you always want the entity framework one. 
Now you can make this a little easier for you. So I can type in Microsoft, which I have to spell right, Mic Microsoft dot entity framework core dot tools unless I spelled something wrong. Well, it doesn't like it, so I'll bring in tools again. Thought I spelled it right, but I must not have. So tools. All right. Microsoft dot entity framework core. Well, that's the one we want. All right. Again, I'm going to add it to the project, which adds it here. Install. It's doing that. I'm going to accept. All right, now I'm going to come back in again and put in SQL server like I did before. And that's the one we want. So in both cases, it's the Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.Tools and the Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.SQL server. All right. And as I showed you before, I like to close it, reopen it just to double check and make sure that it's in there. So I go to installed and those two are in there. Good. So now I'm done with that. So now I'm going to come back in here again to tools, NuGet package manager, package manager console, and I'm going to try to put in what we just put in. And I want to see if it's going to recognize any of this or not. OK. Well, you can see it looks a little bit different now. OK, it asks for the provider. Supply values for the following parameters. Okie dokie. See if it shows in our book a provider. It says minus provider says we're supposed to use that. I already had that in there, or I thought I did, but I'm gonna put it in again anyway. Looks like it's making me type it in. So Microsoft dot entity framework core dot SQL server. All right, oh, well, it started, so let's see what else is in here. It says, unable to find provider assembly, Microsoft Entity Framework Core.SQL server. Ensure the name is correct and it's referenced by the project. What does that mean? That means that I've got to go back in here and view my code. And up at the top, I have to put in a using statement. So using Microsoft dot. Notice it's got entity framework core dot. And there's SQL server. All right. So let me try that file. Save all. Let me go back and try to run this again. You saw all the garbage that was in here. There we go. I'm going to use that 
put that minus force on on the same line here. All right, and now I'm going to put the whole command in that you just saw. Still doesn't give me that. Oh boy, oh boy. All right, went further this time. So if you notice here, it came in and it said, all right, build started, build succeeded. All right, to protect potentially sensitive information, you should move it. What it's saying is if we were in a true application setting, we wouldn't go and put that information out where other people could reference it. All right. We don't have to worry about it because of where we are and what we're doing, etc. All right. Now, it says here an attempt to attach an auto named database for the file failed. A database with the same name exists, or the specified file cannot be opened, or it is loaded in an UNC share. Well, the name, the name does exist. All right, we're trying to do a database first here. All right, cannot be opened. I don't know why it would do that. But it doesn't like that line. So this is what I'm gonna to try to do. An attempt to attach an auto name database failed. Database exists or cannot be opened or is located on the UNC share. Provider is not recognized as a name. Okay, check the spelling. Try again. Output dir is not recognized. Doesn't like any of this stuff. All right. Well, what does that say? Well, one reason it may not like it, I'm gonna try this right now, is it may not like it on multiple lines. What you find when you work on this is it's screwy. It really and truly is screwy the way that it's set up. And it doesn't take much to make something not work. All right, see if that changes anything. Let me clear this, there's so much garbage in there right now. Let me go. All right, that isn't bad. I got one error. An attempt to attach an auto name database failed. A database with the same name exists, or it cannot be opened, or it is located on a UNC share. All right, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you another break till 1030. Sorry about this. We're going to get it to work. All right, but I want to investigate this error during the break. So please come back. Let's make it 1025.
All right, it's 1025. I think the reason I was getting this error is again, I think this should be initial catalog and not attach DB file name, but we're going to check it right now. You'll get all this code that's right here. So. This cannot open the database. The login failed. All right, this must be a bad path. So let me make sure the path is correct to the database. Somewhere in here, I believe the path is located. Oh, you know what? I, for some reason, when I did this, I removed from right here, I removed the double quote. It may have been what the problem is. Let's see if that was it or not. It shouldn't be there. How is that? Okay, that wasn't it. Well, I'm going to have to get out of this because I screwed it up. I don't want that there, but they think the path is wrong. there okay all right i like i said i need to get the right path to the file so henry db these
Han hade en gun. It doesn't like my login. That is the right path. All I can think of is doesn't want the MDF in there. Son of a gun. Jeez Louise. All right. It doesn't like it. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send this to you today, but I want to show you. I've, I've got to double check and make sure there aren't any errors in it. But I'm going to show you what the uh, final is going to be. OK. All right. That's the old copy. Well, I'll show you the old copy. All right. Yeah, we're still going to be working with a bookstore. And the idea is, as it says here, you're going to create a list of type book. All right. And you're going to have three or more authors in there. One author, as it says, should have less than five books. One author should have five to ten books. One author should have greater than 11 books. So you can go out and just Google. There's a there there's an online. The equivalent of it of the IMDB database. There's a, an equivalent one for books. All right, but let's look at what this is supposed to look like. It's really and truly not that terrible. All right, OK, you're going to have two forms. Three if you do want a splash screen. All right, but if you don't have a splash screen, then this is what's going to come up. All right, and if you come in here and you search, you can put in the name of the author. Search by name or by ISBN, you can put in the name of the title of the book. All right, under name here, so that's the name, or you can put in the ISBN. All right, or you can search for an author. You can do this either way. What does this mean? This right here, this. That's a text box. That's a drop down list. This drop down list will have in it three different authors. All right. Notice they've got Edgar Allan Poe. You can put whoever, whomever you want in here. You've got a favorite author. All right. Then when you click search, it'll bring up something like this. Now, this is a crummy example. I did not write this. All right. What do I mean? Well, these should all be different books. It's shown as being the same book. I'll show you mine tomorrow. All right. But it should show you in here all the books by that particular author. OK. And if you click on details, it's going to bring up another form. That other form is going to have a picture of the book. OK. We're a little area in here where you can write reviews for the book or write a review and submit it. And then a thing in here that's going to have the past reviews. Fine, what the heck does all this mean? Well, you're going to have two classes in here, a class called book and a class called review. And what we're going to attempt to do tomorrow, I will do it first to make sure it works, is we're going to attempt to create these two classes. All right, we'll do those together. After we create those two classes, we'll use the NuGet package manager. We'll bring in the SQL server package. We'll bring in the tools package. We will add that using line to our code. 
All right, and with these in here, we'll attempt to go the other way and create the database based off of, we'll create the database based off of the classes. So we will do the code first, all right? This is going to be how you're going to set up each one of the forms. So we'll go over all of this tomorrow. I got to watch it because, uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll show you mine tomorrow. I don't know how much I will or will not show you, but in the past when I show people things, they're like, oh, that's the way we're supposed to do it. I don't want that. I want you to write your own program. Just because I wrote it a certain way doesn't mean that's the way it should be written or that it's the best way that it should be written. All right, so I will give you all of this. In fact, I will send this out to you as soon as I find the one that I redid, and I know I know where it is. But as soon as I find that, I'll send it out to you. We will go through that tomorrow. All right. Now, going back. All right. This didn't work. I mean, that was pretty doggone obvious. All right. What that should have done when we put that in is we did get this. There's two warnings that you should get. One warning when it comes in yellow like this was the one that I got that says, hey, this could be sensitive information in here. You really shouldn't store it out on a public file because there's other ways that you can store the stuff. We're not going to get into that. The other time where you can get the yellow to come up like this is if you don't have all of your permissions set. That's never come up for me. So I believe all of our permissions are set just fine. All right. I'm still not sure what the problem is in here. All right. I'm looking at it and I don't know it. it everything else it seemed to have no problem with, but it didn't like the path. Now they said attach DB file name. The newest way, the way I've always done it is I say initial catalog equal. But I'm going to double check that for tomorrow and make sure that I'm in the right place, etc. If I find out that I made an error, I'll show that to you tomorrow. All right, that should, when you do that though, that should go in and create all of these for you. So if nothing else, I'll go tomorrow and I'll use the one that is the MMA books one. Maybe I should have done that one to begin with. I don't know. But notice it created all the classes for us. So this is a database first example that creates the classes. What I'd like to do with you tomorrow is a code first example that's going to create the database. The reason I want to do that is twofold. Number one, that's typically the way it's done today. And number two, you will already have the classes. All right, so that'll help as far as you creating the database. All right. And that's the other error that you can get, as it says, if you don't have the view definition rights set up. I've never had that one come up for me. All right, let's just continue quickly on the code for the DB context class. Well, notice what it does in here. All right, it comes in and it says, these are your tables. So this is what it creates for your tables. All right. And it says basically that it's going to be working with these. These are going to be our DB sets. So these are going to end up being our tables. Then there's two methods that it's going to go and override for you. All right. And this right here, what you see right there. All right. That is coming in and setting up your configuration section for you. You say, I don't get that. We'll go over it tomorrow. All right, and this is the on model creating. This is going to handle, it says fixed length, but it'll handle things like setting up foreign keys for you. I think what I'll do, I should have done this. I thought this would work without a hitch. Guess what? I was wrong big time. I'm going to use their example tomorrow and try to go back and redo this. I don't want to do it now because with the luck I've been having so far today, I'll screw it up and I don't want to screw it up in front of you. So I will do it tomorrow. 
I will do this first myself to make sure all of it works. Then we'll do this and we'll, cr we'll create all this. You won't have to worry about even doing it. I'm just trying to show you for completeness how you can do the database first. All right. And it will come in here and it will create this code for you. Here is an example of the data annotations. So what it's saying here is that's a primary key. What it's saying here is even though it's called customer ID with a little d, when you put it in and show it in a table, call it customer ID with a big D. You can if you want. This is just a column header. You could have even said customer space ID here. This says that the system is, or that the name is zero to 100 characters. This says it cannot use Unicode characters. All right, this right here is the inverse property. So for lack of better words, it's kind of the opposite property of what you're working with. Here it says what our foreign key is. And here it's got a navigation table. And we've already talked about foreign keys. All right, it's no biggie in here. We're going to go over the navigation table tomorrow. It's not going to make much sense unless I have a working copy that we have here on our screen. All right, so we'll do that. We'll take a look at all of the code. All right, this is going to be something that you're going to need to understand your connection string. So we'll do all that. And then we're going to get into how to use link with the F core. Now, this is the reason last week I showed you what I showed you. The difference between this and what we did last week is minimal. I used link pad. Here, they are doing it right inside of a C-sharp program. So there's a couple things you have to do, like set up a context, et cetera. But these are the same kinds of things we were writing ourselves last week. Okay. How to load related objects. This is if you're working with a one to many relationship. So we'll look at that. All right. How to use EF Core. This is the key. How to how to use CRUD on a database. All right. So what does that mean? Well, notice here, they're adding a new customer. There's their name, there's their address, there's their city, there's their state. And when you do this, that adds it. But, but until you come in and, and do the save changes, it doesn't change the database. It changes it on your screen, but it doesn't change the database. So this is an insert. This is an update. So you are finding, all right, something and you're doing an update. All right, here is a deletion. We'll have to look at all three of those. Now, you're like, well, geez, it sounds like we're gonna do a hell of a lot tomorrow. It's not that big of a thing because we're gonna do this. I want to show you and prove to you that database first works. We're going to be concentrating on the code first. All right. Databases, typically, when you try to do something, you'll put it into a try catch block. Why? Because you can have all sorts of different exceptions that come up. In this case, you're trying to do an update. So notice there is an update exception. Typically, when you do this, even though they don't show it there, Typically, you would also underneath that DB update exception, you would just catch a regular exception as well. All right. Just in case something else were to go wrong. All righty. Okay. Concurrency, we will talk about tomorrow. I'm not going to show it to you. Why? Because concurrency occurs when two people are sharing the same server. We don't have that situation here so I can talk about it, but it's virtually impossible to demonstrate 
I think, on just when you're using the same machine for both your client and your server. All right, but they mention here what happens when two people try to update the same record at the same time. You get what's called a concurrency conflict. All right, by default, this is the, the worst way of doing it. By default, EF Corp uses last in wins. So that means if I am updating a record in the database and Mary is updating a, data, a record in the database and I make a bunch of changes and save it, and after I do that, Mary makes a bunch of changes and saves it, her changes overwrite mine because she was the last one to basically work it in, make it work, all right? So typically that isn't used, but it is the default, which means if you don't tell it to do something else. You can also have optimistic concurrency. As it says, the program checks whether the record has already been updated or deleted since the person retrieved it. If it has been updated or deleted, it throws a concurrency ex exception where you typically would just say, problem with record, try again later and you refuse to allow the update or the delete to take place, all right? You can even get more than that. There's a pessimistic concurrency where you can lock a record, you can lock a database, you can even get it to where I think you can lock a field in a record, but typically you can lock the entire database, which isn't done often, or you can lock a table, which again isn't done often, or you can lock a record. And typically when you're using pessimistic concurrency, you, you lock it at what's called the record level. All right, so it's right there. It says most apps don't use it. It assumes the concurrency conflicts will happen and avoids them by locking the record while it's being updated. So since locking it creates its own problems, most apps don't use it. I don't even agree with that. It depends. So they got a big section in here on how to check for a concurrency conflicts. We're not going to talk about it. I've already talked to you about what it is. But we will talk a little bit tomorrow on this, how to bind controls. All right. As it says, when you use EF Core, you can bind controls to an entity collection or the results. So in other words, Thought they showed a picture in here. Maybe they don't. All right. Here's an example of binding to a combo box. Who cares? You should care big time. Why should you care big time? Because you're going to want to bind the name of the authors to that combo box. So when we go over that tomorrow, look at it because you'll want to do the same type of thing. And there's other bindings that you can do as well. As it says, you can bind to a combo box. You can also bind to a data grid view control. If you remember the data grid view control when we did the SQL tester program, all right, that will show you all of the records that meet whatever it is you asked for. So in other words, if we did this, all right, and we put in Poe, it would show us all of Poe's records. Now we'll talk tomorrow about paging. I'm going to ask that you try paging. If you can do it, I'm going to give you a few extra points of extra credit. If you can't do it, I'm not going to take off. But if there were 10 records in here and you didn't use paging, it would show you all 10. Currently, we're using paging. So we've got five records on page one. If you click, you'd have five records on page two. If you click again, it's going to have one to five records on page three. That's how you use paging. All right. Creating a data access class that's in here. All right, it says so far the chapter has shown how to use EF Core 
from the code in a form. If you decide to use it, something other than EF Core, all right, you need to use ADO.net. They start to explain it in here, but this is really what Chapter 21 is about, which we don't cover. All right. I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at my project. I'm going to look at the project they have in the chapter here. We're going to look at both for tomorrow. All right. And if I decide, which I probably will, we you, you probably won't even be responsible in this chapter for doing the written test because there's a lot of stuff in here that we're skipping. All right. I would like to go over this at the end of the chapter, this customer maintenance app because they do show you in here. So if you put in customer nine and you click get customer, it fills in that customer's information for you. Then if you click add, it brings up the same thing for add and for modify. All right, the difference is if you click add, this is empty. It has no name, no address, no city. All right, it has the drop down for state, but this is empty as well. And if you choose modify with record nine, it brings in all the record information. All right, and delete will ask you whether or not you want to delete it. Okay. So we will look at the code that does that because there's a few things in there you'll probably want to use for your project. All right, so a little bit early, and it's been kind of a cluster of a period. I apologize for that. The good news is what I explained to you earlier in the chapter here, or before we got into the chapter, about what the entity framework is and the intro that I gave you to it and the getting started and the code first, everything I showed you up until the code first is correct. All right. But tomorrow, we will really concentrate on the stuff you'll need for your project, all right? If for some reason I don't finish it tomorrow, I promised you you'd have three lab days this week. So if for some reason by 11.30 tomorrow, I don't finish this chapter, then I'm going to take tomorrow afternoon with nobody present and I'm going to finish it then and put it out on the system. You will have lab Wednesday, Thursday and Friday of this week, and really for the rest of the semester. All right. Sorry that uh, some of this at least didn't work the way I wanted it to. I guarantee you I will check everything tomorrow and make sure everything works. I will talk to you then. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks.